I need some more energy. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> That's better. Uh, yeah, so I know talks after lunch are quite boring sometimes and people feel sleepy. So I have put a lot of gifts because I like them and I hope uh, it will make my slides look less boring for that matter. All right. Um, so I'll start with introducing myself. I am working with, uh, I'm currently working as a freelance kernel developer and uh, with a bunch of embedded companies. And I'm also a co-organizer of a three month scholarship program called Rails Girls Summer of Code. Uh, I also handle Linux kernel projects for Outreach, uh, which is again a three month internship program for the underrepresented group in tech and open source. And I'm also a Linux kernel and open source evangelist. I'm taking a bunch of case lectures in Indian universities and I also run a bunch of meetups in uh, some cities in India. And last but not least, uh, which is quite an important thing, I'm uh, open learning and open education enthusiast. Uh, and this talk is also more or less about that. So uh, what this talk is about, uh, it's about my journey uh, from uh, knowing the definitions from books about Linux and Linux kernel to uh, implementing it a, uh, in a practical way. Uh, not really a journey from tra transforming from human to cat, but <laughs> rather just uh, implementing the theories in a uh, in practical way and understanding how uh, things works in industry. And it is also more or less about uh, how we as a developer learn things uh, and uh, in the open source environment and how we collaborate uh, on a bunch of things uh, in the open source projects. So uh, I will first talk about what my idea of Linux kernel engineer was uh, when I started uh, with uh, just these two words, uh, what Linux kernel means and stuff like that. So uh, first thing first, I thought that uh, to be a Linux kernel engineer, you need to be someone uh, like extremely talented, extremely good in uh, C programming. Uh, so sort of a visa, uh, and this was me. <laughs> so uh, in the university I come from, uh, nobody knew uh, what GCC is. Uh, they still don't know. Uh, the universities I go for uh, giving case lectures, I have to tell them uh, what GCC is, what, what Linux kernel is, what Linux is. Um, we use this thing uh, in the university. This is some proprietary. Uh, compiler called Turbo C and people use Windows over there and I just didn't like programming at that time because it's an ugly screen like I mean I don't like bashing tools but it's really an ugly screen and <laughs> then you have this thing just the black screen where it, uh, where it gives you output and you're like uh, this is like uh, are we living in like 1994, we have blue screen and then black screen to give us the output. Second thing, I thought that you need to be a Linux ninja. You need to understand what Linux is, uh, what, uh, all the operating, uh, operating system fundamentals, uh, and also, you know, uh, how things work from hardware to software level. And again, um, I didn't know about it because this is what I studied. This was the only thing we had in our operating system course where the kernel was mentioned. So it's like just the uh, three sentence about what Linux kernel is, just, just the definitions, you know, and that's it. And the second thing we learned in the op operating system uh, fundamentals was this. We literally had to give uh, and you know, write assignments and uh, give tests where they just ask you, what does the command CP means in the terminal? Uh, what is the use of it? 
so we have to like you know uh, memorize all of those commands and the use of them and then we write assignments over and over uh, about these things so uh, just knowing uh, the definition of Linux kernel and the commands wasn't didn't really seem like something to dive into the kernel programming. Third thing, uh, I am not a native English speaker, although uh, English, English is one of the official language of India. Uh, I studied in my mother tongue, which is not an official language of India. S uh, so until 12th standard, uh, I couldn't speak English. Uh, we do have English as a subject in our, you know, uh, school program, but it's a subject. There, uh, there, uh, they taught us uh, this thing as a subject, not a language. So it's hard to switch from a subject to language. And uh, everything you see in the Linux kernel is obviously uh, in English. So you need to have a, more or less a good command over the language. And I just knew about these things probably at that time. Fourth thing, uh, for some reason I thought that this is how Linux kernel engineers looks like. Uh, they are like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> uh, they have probably some tricks uh, where they, you know, save information in their hippocampus and then fetch it and then probably write the programs and wow, their code works. Uh, so I don't know how to, uh, I didn't know how to switch from this to this. <laughs> it seemed really hard. Again, okay, not the cat to human transformation. <laughs> so yeah, so this was like a distant dream for that uh, for that moment. Then how did I start hacking on the Linux kernel? I got fractured. No, seriously. I'm not kidding, I got fractured and I was on bed for like four months. Now what these four months did, I had no assignments to write in my university. I got relief from all the assignments. So, uh, so basically assignments in my university meant that I have to you know, copy paste the uh, texts from the textbook and not really understand what it means uh, in a practical way. Uh, which was like a complete waste of time, but you have to do it if you want to uh, get the grades and if you want to, you know, go through one semester to, uh, to another. So most of the time was spent in writing this assignment uh, during my undergraduation. But when I got fractured, I got time to, you know, hack on the things because I didn't have to write any assignments during that time. So then I uh, installed uh, Linux distro because I knew about this thing and I, we had uh, sort of uh, the books uh, written by Robert Lowe and uh, the Linux Reverse Travels books by Greg Crow Hartman. So I was used to uh, read these books in library and no one was anyway using it so librarian was like, okay, just have it. So uh, that was also a good thing. So I started installing Linux over there, and uh, then I came across this thing, GCC. And it was amazing, because uh, you can like literally uh, see what was the meaning of object file, why it's there, uh, what's happening in the, you know, just the, these two lines of Hello World program, you can backtrack and see uh, what's happening over there from hardware to, uh, to the compiler level. And it was so amazing uh, that then I went uh, on internet and I tried to find the books from where I can learn uh, C programming again, because the Turbo C1 wasn't really a successful experiment at that time. Uh, after learning C and, uh, uh, you know, just hacking around Linux distribution, I also uh, cloned the repo uh, of Linux kernel. I came across uh, programs like Outreachy and GSOC. Uh, 
at that time in the GSOC we didn't have a list of specific Linux kernel projects. So uh, someone told me that I should look into the program called Outreach. It was called OPW at that time, I guess. And uh, I looked into it. We had like projects, and then there were um, tasks by mentors where you uh, work on the code, and you need to start with the first patch tutorial, which is like very well written uh, by the person who was previously handling the Linux kernel projects. So it was uh, so it was quite a, a good thing to start from them, uh, start from there, because there was there were like instructions from installing to a Linux distro to sending your first patch, and how you uh, understand about the patch philosophy, how you write uh, commit logs, um, how you communicate with the uh, people in the mailing lists. They also have a separate mailing list for the uh, outreach applicants, where uh, mentor review mentors uh, are like reviewing uh, patches coming from the applicants. And uh, Greg is also involved with the project, so man, uh, so applicants are just sending these cleanup patches into the staging directory, so they don't don't really have to uh, interact with the other subsystem maintainers who don't want uh, cleanup patches for that uh, time period. And then I got uh, selected for Outreach. -y. I worked for three months uh, under uh, under the under my mentor working on the Coxinel project, and then I graduated and got a job. This was like sort of my uh, excitement level every time my patch was applied because it was uh, uh, it was an amazing feeling uh, by the when you get these messages from uh, maintainers and uh, after after i uh, i was done with my kernel internship i started applying for jobs and i got a job as a linux kernel engineer at oracle I worked there for two and a half years uh, in the security engineering group, and then I started doing freelancing. But what else? So that was my journey of being a Linux kernel engineer from knowing the definition of Linux kernel. But do everyone have to get fractured to be a Linux kernel hacker? No, right? Uh, then what? So uh, then I came across something which is called uh, growth mindset. So uh, if anyone knows, uh, like around three, 30 years ago, Dr. Uh, Carl and uh, some of the researchers actually uh, did this uh, experiment where they were trying on the students uh, of how uh, how thinking about uh, intelligence and uh, thinking positively about intelligence helps you uh, in your personal growth. So they give these two terms, uh, say fixed mind mindset and uh, growth mindset. So growth mindset is something where you um, sort of think that, uh, think truly and think deeply that. Uh, why are you not able to uh, do something? You can do it. And then you just uh, backtrack, like we do in the tracing, uh, that what was wrong over there, uh, why, this is some, uh, why something is confus confusing for me. And uh, then you try to uh, learn over there. And then you s uh, spend, uh, spend time and more efforts to uh, get smarter. And then you achieve things. But again, can positive attitude help you to be a kernel hacker? No. Uh, so like anything else, uh, learning is, I guess, a skill where you need to uh, get better at when you start putting efforts. And efforts also means uh, different things for people. Uh, you. Uh, you may or may not 
have same style of putting effort or same style of learning but uh, i guess it's important that we try to learn things uh, continuously and don't stop over there so i learned sort of six skills uh, on how do how you keep up uh, self learning in specifically for the linux kernel project so i'll just talk about it now uh first thing first uh, it was really important to find uh, right resources because we we can't have books for everything uh, so source code is like the best resource uh, because the kernel uh, because of the linux kernel projects nature we have like uh, 2 and 1/2 develop 2 uh, and 1/2 month or 2 two months development cycle i guess and uh, uh now so it's it's changing so fast that it's hard to cope up with everything every new change coming over there so it's important that uh, we learn how, uh, how to uh, we we teach our self how to learn from source code uh mailing list archives are again something which helps you to understand what is going on and uh, different developers perspective around it then again uh git git is really cool i like uh git blame a lot because it helps me to uh to understand original developers perspective behind writing certain code uh, before i change it and then of course uh conference talks like this and uh, kernel.org uh, planet kernel planet uh, .org with all the kernel developers uh, blogs are hosted second thing uh, asking questions uh, coming from a background where uh, asking questions wasn't really uh, celebrated it's really hard to fast uh, try to ask questions uh, specifically when you are starting out and you may or may not know uh, the other per other person's perspective behind uh, if it's cool to ask questions or if it's not uh, so uh, it's important to figure out why uh, you don't know x then you go and search over things uh, why it is difficult for you to know about this thing and then you go and ask questions i guess good questions uh, versus bad questions is also a uh, sort of important to figure out uh, for example if 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 i want to uh, if i want to know about something or if i want to know um, if uh, certain uh, code is written why certain code is written in certain way i can't really just go and ask the person who has written it i think it's important to first see uh, probably mailing list archives or uh, the discussion that happened uh, before that patch was applied and then you can probably discuss with the person about that and yeah it was also important at that time to understand the mailing list uh, etiquettes uh because of uh because of the nature of linux kernel it's an open source project and uh, if someone is coming from completely different background top posting bottom posting why why is it uh, important why is it also important to uh make points in a way that people can understand it um so yeah uh third thing uh for the linux kernel it's also understand uh it's also important to understand maintainer's style uh not only uh communication wise uh, code wise as well some maintainers prefer some macros or some functions or code to be written in certain way uh than other maintainer so and it's not documented anywhere for now so you can just uh understand this only by uh by looking at the conversations uh in that mailing list and uh, how that person is approaching so and so uh problem and then uh, again a uh, patch series versus a uh, patch per change uh, is also something where you need to understand 
again the maintainers perspective sometimes maintain uh, for some changes some maintainers are fine with like one uh, one patch and sometimes they want you to uh, you know split it up in multiple patches uh, so and fourth thing is automating the learning so when i was starting it was uh, it was really hard to under uh, first you need to first figure out how you your, you as yourself uh, uh, prefer to work and they, then you need to figure out uh, how other people are working and based on your workflow you can automate the uh, automate your working flow i guess so there are git uh, uh, you can use the existing tools like grab or vim editor tricks and i also wrote a bunch of my own scripts based on what i wanted to learn or or the project i am working on which helped uh, which helps to you know uh, understand things in a faster way uh fifth is uh keep updating your knowledge about uh, kernel systems so again um if you are working in a cer certain subsystem uh, and you uh, if you are going to do a certain change which affects uh, you know three wide uh, which requires you to uh, contribute in a three wide uh, uh, files then it's uh, important if this api is like you know preferred over there or not if it's deprecated and if you can also take uh, you can also make that code uh, better in a way that uh, it's useful for everyone and uh, yeah uh, again from subsystem specific git trees to uh, you also need to understand uh, about the stable tree and where you, when you need to cc it when not uh, and how bug fixes works how if it's about the security uh, related uh, git trees then uh, cves and other tag uh, git, git tree tags and stuff like that so it's important if you uh, keep updating your knowledge about these things. And sixth, uh, uh, which is about improving improving your craft as a programmer. So uh, now this can be subjective for a lot of people. Some people just prefer to write the code that works. Some people uh, some people prefer the right uh, to write the code that works. Plus, it is consistent for the uh, for the current style of that file or that subsystem. Uh, but some people write uh, extremely intelligent code, and it's it's really good to uh, good. Uh, so this is like a positive point of working in. Uh, there are a lot of others, but working in op uh, open source project, the thing is that. Uh, you come across all sort of programmers and you see the mailing list conversations you see uh, how people are arguing over code changes and stuff and it's it's really exciting when something ends up in the in the tree and it's so uh, so uh, well written uh, compared to what you you know studied in the books and stuff for example uh, i really like the uh, the way max is now uh, in the kernel after the VLA changes uh, happened, uh, and before it was just you know something we used to uh, we used to study in KR book, but now it's like this really beautifully and intelligently written function, uh, and yeah, and yeah, uh, learning from other programmers is again as I said, it's important to. Uh, understand other program how how their mind uh, mind is working and how you can also learn from them so yeah that's it uh, from my side i uh, would also like love to know how people here who are like working in the linux kernel for say uh, 10 years or 15 years also try to uh, update uh, their knowledge or also try to uh, evolve around their learning skills. Thanks.
So I'm not a kernel developer, but I'm just curious as to, with all the recent Bruha in the media, etc., how have you found engaging on the mailing list, uh, etc.? Was it relatively easy? Did you feel threatened or put off in any shape or form? Uh, for me, it was easy because uh, I think one of the reason is because I started with the outreach. Uh, so as we have this uh, separate mailing list, which is separate from the subsystem maintainers and stuff, uh, we are taught how to communicate with other people, how your patch should be in a perfect manner and things like that. So, and because they are, they are, uh, the mentors are also kernel programmers, uh, it's uh, important to, for you to like, understand their perspective and stuff like that. So after that, it becomes quite easy to, you know, then again go into the whole uh, black hole of Linux kernel <laughs> subsystems and uh, then uh, communicate over there. But, yeah. Hi. Um, I think it's like encouraging people to write their first patch is a really fantastic thing. Um, and like you said, uh, there's a kind of a good feeling at the end when you see it getting applied and you get that email back saying, thanks, applied. One thing we don't do a very good job of is encouraging people to review their first patch and perhaps reviewing a patch from someone else. And there's no kind of thanks for reviewing my patch, you don't get that feeling at the end. Have you got any ideas how we can sort of um, encourage people to partake in reviewing as well as writing patches? Right, but I just don't see, I see way more patches being written than reviewed and I just wondered if there are any ideas you had to encourage people. Yeah, uh, I think one of the way can be, like if from the subsystems, uh, subsystem maintainers point of view, if they see uh, that the, some sort of developers are, have done really good job in the subsystem, they can just probably personally connect, uh, like, you know, talk with them that it would be good to, you know, uh, if you can help me with reviewing these patches because I'm not having time or whatever. Uh, and I guess that's how people start reviewing uh, patches. I have seen many people doing that. Uh, for example, in the DRM subsystem, uh, I guess uh, Daniel actively tries to do this. Uh, and in, even in the IRC channel, uh, he asks for the reviews and stuff. Uh, for like specific person that hey you knew uh, you did this right uh, in that file so why don't you just review this thing as well and uh, uh, probably it would be good to have your point of view there so yeah okay uh, really quick um, uh, it's just a question because you're saying like what for new people to review patches um, yeah, I, getting, getting people to do their first review. Uh, yeah, get people to do their first review. Actually, I, I almost want to say maintainers should be doing probably more reviewing and less coding at a time. Agreed. I was just talking with some other people and saying that we should be encouraging new people coming in and helping them through and re, the, the maintainers could start because we have the experience for the review. I actually find reviewing is much more difficult than writing the code. Yep. It's worse. It's worse, yeah. And, and sometimes it's fine because I, I've actually spent weeks where I've just, all I did was review for like two or three weeks and haven't written a single thing of code. And I say to myself, I haven't done anything. Then, you know, someone tell me, he goes, no, you've reviewed all these patches. That's much more valuable than actually you going out and writing the code. Mm -hmm. So just to make another comment in the reviewing direction, maybe it's not so clear to people what reviewing a patch implies. And so... Maybe if there seem to be lower consequences for saying that I've reviewed this, um, it could get people, I mean, it seems like, you know, we need to be Steve to be a reviewer. You know, we need to be an expert to be a reviewer. Um, there's nothing to really encourage people to somehow start reviewing. Um, well, and my, so my there could be some kind of like, you know, I'm not an expert, but I have actually studied this code and um, mm -hmm. so, Actually, uh, I uh, the thing is, I almost want to say that you need to be, to be a reviewer, to me, the reviewer has to know more than the author, mm -hmm. per se. Um, otherwise, uh, why, I, mean, I would love yeah. to have more reviewers. We say, mm -hmm. oh, we need more reviewers. But the reason why we don't have more reviewers is to review code, you actually have to know more than the author itself. So we need, that's why I say I want to turn the tables around. I want more people submitting code and making the maintainers become more reviewers than me, because we're the ones in the position to review and help yeah. and encourage. Yeah. That's what maintainers usually do. I mean, I'm, you can probably ask any maintainer yeah. in the room, and, and 
basically 80% of the work they're doing already is reviewing. You cannot do that more because otherwise they would just go insane and not know more than, well, no, no, than no, the people no, submitting things anymore, right? No, but um, you, you, this, this is, we, we already did reach a limit um, where, where main, there, there are nice talks from Wolfgang about that where how the maintainership model doesn't scale, etc. because of exactly the reviewer problem. Um, yeah. if, you, if you have secondary 30, whatever, third theory, whatever it's called, um, level people in there that uh, take over, say, 50% of the review. I mean, I, I had lots of patches already on the lists where um, other people were re reviewing it, it took it down to V5, and then I jump in and say, like, well, I still have these two nits, but the rest is great because somebody else reviewed it. Right. I have a response to that, but I'll let go. Yeah. yeah, so I think as a maintainer, one role that you have is also to realize when other people are becoming better than you and uh, actually maybe not appoint them as other maintainers because then you also drop on them the uh, testing and uh, uh, applying, following the mailing list chores, which can be a big thing to have uh, all at the time. But you can perhaps uh, CC them on patches and ask them for their opinion you can list them as reviewers uh, in the maintainers file because there's also the R tag for reviewers. So I mean, as, as a maintainer, one test that you have is that of uh, giving appreciations to, to your contributors and, but also offload your work to them. I mean, uh, you give them appreciation because you are a nice person, but also because uh, you need them you know, for your project to scale. Okay, so go back to, so right now you're talking about people like you and me are already at that point of like max review ability and I, that's, I do there's a lot of maintainers out there. The Linux kernel has tons of maintainers that are just writing code and they're not doing reviews. Those are the people I'm talking about. I'm talking about, and also I look around and people that I find doing a lot of, oops, closer? I wasn't sure, I, I thought, I, I have like too many people, uh, I go and say, look, could you review this? I've actually said, I'm not touching the, or I'm not going to take this patch on that until like this person reviews it. I've actually messed it around, so I'm not doing the review, I'm letting someone else I know is quality. Yes, I think maintainers have twofold, and this goes with your question. The maintainers, I think, are responsible of saying, you're good enough, I need you to review it, and start pushing down and say, could you review it? Because after a while, you should start off beginning as a developer, writing code, but after a year or two, you know the code, you know stuff, you know a lot that a new person comes in, the maintainer should now ask you, who's been there for a couple of years, submitting patches, say, could you review this for me? So we need to have, I think the reviewing needs to come from top down. Okay, so uh, I comment on that. Uh, well, I, if, you don't have to be an expert in the, you know, overall uh, in, 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 in some problem space in the kernel to review code effectively. You can, you just need to be familiar with a specific piece of it, right? If you are, and that's sufficient, if you say, oh, okay, I, I've learned this particular piece because, I don't know, I was learning uh, how the kernel works or something, and I can give comments on it. And if somebody changes this, this particular piece, you could actually uh, chime in and comment the patch and say, you know what, I don't understand what you are doing or something like that because I'm, I'm, I think I'm familiar with this code and I don't see a point in your changes, right? And that's enough. Have you seen people do that? Review. My question is, have people done that? No, and that's the problem, right? I don't know if people do that. That's the thing is, I don't think people go through and look and say, I want to, or like, oh, I understand this. We have this vision that people are going to do that. I don't see people doing that. I've never seen anyone do that. And the only time I've got a, and if I see a review by, by someone that I don't know, and I'm like, this person's never written code in this subsystem, I won't trust that review. Well, a re review that, re reviewed by is, is, a, is, is an empty statement by itself, right? Uh, it, it has to be supported by something. But well, I think the point is, I think people think reviewers are lesser than authors, where I think it's the reverse. Yeah, it is to some extent, but, but my point is that you don't have to be a, a, you know, a, a total expert overall or, or something, you know, on, in some topic that to, be, to give a significant review of, of a change in a kernel. Uh, I, I personally have a, a, a different view of this. Uh, I think that too often 
people consider that uh, they are taking a responsibility by reviewing some code because if they say something stupid, they will uh, um, cause the person to write the patch differently and possibly cause more harm than, than good. And uh, I think that instead, people should think whether or not they can help save someone else time, even by doing a partial review on certain parts. And sometimes it happens to me, I see some patches with, with obvious bugs in them on areas or subsystem I don't know well, and sometimes I just take one minute to respond to uh, the email and saying, there is a, a problem here, I don't know this code, but definitely there is a problem, and that's all. And probably I will have saved uh, one or two minutes to uh, another maintainer whose job would possibly have been to spend some time on this patch, but uh, at least I will have helped. And I think we should encourage uh, a lot of people to, to do this. Uh, you don't need, indeed, I agree. Uh, uh, to, to really one real quick thing. The only person to ever be um, uh, basically blocked from LKML, the reason why that person was blocked was because they were giving reviews incorrectly. Maybe, but I mean, uh, if you... And much more he did than that. If you give I mean, a lot the problem with the person was much more. <laughs> it wasn't if, just if the If you give too, too many incorrect reviews, there is definitely a problem with the person. Uh, however, uh, if you try to be uh, reasonable, you do it like you would do with your own code, and you say, look, uh, you, you made a mistake, uh, you used the wrong uh, size of in your mem set or whatever. It's something that any of us can do, and it already saves a lot of time. Uh, you will possibly agree with me that uh, among your review, your reviews, which took uh, two weeks of your time, possibly half of them could have been done by other people without requiring your skills in your specific areas. Well, as long as the person's an expert programmer at some point, yes, you could review. But I don't want beginners to be reviewing code to just to, just to learn, like, oh, I'm going to say ah. something wrong and maybe I'll learn by this. No, I don't no, want that. No, that, that's not my point at all. That, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that if you have, if you no, have I know, certain... I know, what I'm saying is, I, I'm just, my point was, like, I think what the maintainers, my point was that maintainers should spot people that could do reviews, encourage them to review. That's my point. Mm. Okay. Just go back to the, uh, my original point was that maybe there needs to be some kind of pathway and there needs to be some kind of, I mean, you're saying, so person X who you've never heard of, who's never contributed to your subsystem or something like that has done a reviewed by and that has no value to be, you because you don't have any confidence in person X. Um, but at least person X, maybe we can somehow still encourage person X to review as long as they're not giving out consistently bad advice or something like that, um, to have some kind of pathway into... Where's the person's, person's X background? That's my question. A, a review by means that you have a, a background of somehow that you mm -hmm. can give good advice. Okay. So maybe, the, maybe there needs to be some kind of tag that is lower than reviewed by. Act by. Yeah, act by is certainly... Uh, in in yeah. fact... Uh, 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 I, uh, th this is a very interesting point you are making, uh, Stephen, uh, because I agree with you that a reviewed by tag uh, means that the person has some uh, form of authority on, uh, on the patch. I totally agree. And the type of review I'm doing myself, uh, I mean, I never ask to add a reviewed by because uh, I rarely have the, the knowledge on the whole review. I just try to spot quickly if I see something uh, wrong, just because uh, we all do mistakes, and if I can spot a few mistakes so that the author respins a, a patch which will uh, have less mistakes, it will save someone else time. That's all. And in this case, I don't consider myself a reviewer. However, I spend some time reviewing code. You see, this is the difference I'm making on this. But a lot of times I say, like, a certain level, Conus, okay, I can't pronounce it, Conus, uh, your tool. Conus, Coxino, Coxino. So I, I, I don't speak French. Uh, so Coxino, <laughs> as everyone here knows. <laughs> so Coxino, if actually, that's the type of reviews I love. Is like when someone says, "By the way, your patch that just said this automated tools." Like I said, I, I, don't, I actually have more trust in your tool than someone that I've never heard of before. So when someone, a lot of times, I'll send a patch and someone, like I'll get like a robot or someone, someone I never know of says, "Hey, Coxinel." 
spotted this for you. And then I go, when I, say, when I hear them say, Cosinell spotted this for me, I turn around and say, okay, I'm going to look into this. If just someone says, I see this in your code, I may ignore it. So having some, back, if I don't know the person. So um. that actually adds a lot of help. I mean, if you want to get new people come in, have them run code, have them do this, and then say, oh, this tool found a problem. In a lot of cases, it was actually the, uh, the one time that happened, it was a bug. It found a bug in my code that I posted. So uh, I accept that. So in, in my opinion, if somebody tells you oh, I see a problem in this patch, you better should treat, you know, treat that uh, seriously unless you have a reason not to trust this person because it, that, that may really be a problem, right? And like, just ignoring it is not useful. Well, uh, well let me, let me uh, get a little more detail about this. A lot of times the code is a little subtle, subtle. Yeah. And then, I'm like, yes, I could see by, by a novice person, it looks like a problem, but I'm like, okay, a little bit more knowledge, you understand what is going on. That's the came in. That, that's okay. But it, uh, on the other not, hand. I don't have time to teach. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, what happens sometimes, and, and not, not, not even like very uh, readily, is that somebody spots a real problem and talks about it. And, and then you may not realize that there was a problem until you look at it thoroughly, you know, deep into it and see, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, there is a problem. So well, I, well, tend to, I tend to really uh, try to, uh, try to uh, you know, take, take uh, comments like that seriously. Uh, because the, I just had a, uh, a, you know, there was a case where I just uh, withdrawn my own patch because somebody spotted a problem in it. And it was a person who never, like, talked to me before. <laughs> so the, okay, there are cases like that, too. Okay, I, I'm going just to, yes. Yep, okay. So real quick, real quick, just I want to confirm, so just validate something. I, I shouldn't say I ignore the person that, like I said, I don't ignore a patch from someone. I actually look at it, and if I look at it and say, okay, this is just, I just say, it's okay, don't worry about it. I actually do look at the code, but I won't spend as much time as if they said a tool found this. If, if I go through and say, yes, I see that, I'll, I will acknowledge them, I don't ignore them. Right. I just acknowledge them, it goes, yeah, yeah, I, that's fine. I've, yet, I've had a few people do that to me, I just like, I say, no, no, no. I know what I'm doing here, it's, it's okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, to me, it's just wasting my time. I mean, I do respond, I do think that, but I'd rather have the tool telling me it's wrong, because those have not been false positive, where I've had, ran, I had three or four random people, and it's been false positives. Well, false positives happen, yeah, you know, like regardless of the whether the tool, uh, you use the tool or people look at it. So both of them can give you false positives. Uh, and both of them also can spot real problems. I actually have one question about the process. Um, since you got into it a couple of years ago, you probably still remember how it went. Uh, is there anything you would improve in the process of new people getting into the Linux kernel development? Yeah. W what would you do? Uh, do you have some sort of feedback for pretty much everyone in the room? Yeah, I mean, uh, whenever I go to take uh, guest lectures in universities and stuff, uh, we have first a kernel patch tutorial, but what after that? We have to do files, but they are like they are not properly managed or they are not properly written. That uh, it's just like uh, a developer wrote a driver. They knew that this this thing uh, could be fixed at some point, and they just uh, put it uh, put those lines over there. But uh, how can new people who want to get involved in the Linux kernel can find tasks? Yeah. So uh, yeah. I think it would be good to have some sort of platform. So I just uh, manage this repo uh, whenever I come across a new project going on in the Linux kernel. And if, the, uh, if I have talked with that maintainer, uh, they have some tasks in mind, I would just write it over there and uh, then just point to that repo to uh, other people. But uh, it's just me, so, and yeah. Uh, do you actually plan to make this public, or do you plan to grow this platform into something? It's, it's no, no. This is just a git, uh, just a GitHub repo. It's uh, right over there. Uh, I just put this link in uh, all of my slides in the uh, in the guest lectures I uh, give in the university. So uh, if any maintainers in the room even have those tasks, uh, they are free. F uh, just feel free to send a pull request over there. That, that's a really good idea. Thanks.
Uh, yes, excuse me. Uh, I didn't really understand. Did, did you start with UDIP Tula challenge? Or did you know about this, uh, uh, this training, UDIP Tula? No, no, I know about this challenge, but it was like dead uh, since some years. Uh, yes, that's what I have heard from the people who have tried it. I didn't really try, try it. Uh, I directly started from the outreach. It, ha it has closed, right? Yeah, and my question now is maybe to our kernel developer here, uh, maybe link it and tie it to this former project and closed project to Vitula. Is there something uh, to replace it? Is there uh, something, a new, new platform, maybe like you said, or a new uh, monitoring system to uh, enroll new developer into the kernel? Uh, no, she is from Outreach. Outreach is a different one, which is from... Uh, Outreach is a different one. Not, it is not the same as UDIP Tula. UDIP Tula was uh, open to everyone. But Outreach, as far as I know, it's only open to... Um, uh, it's, for an, uh, it's for underrepresented groups in uh, open source, so they're like eligibility criteria. So stuff. when I started with Kernel, I, I could not enter Outreachy or OPW as that name was because I am a, I am, I, I am, I am a male. Males are not allowed in that fund. And when it started, I think it was only, only al allowed for um, so some, some classes of people from USA only not anywhere else, and, and, and later, later India was added, and so visually we could come in. <coughs> All right, so it means there is different kind of program to enroll a new developer in the kernel then? There but aren't many. I would like to see uh, more of them. Uh, just as a side note, uh, just as a side note, you, 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 started with, you started with the kernel with a broken leg, and I started with the started with kernel with a broken hand. Okay. <laughs> so it seems people from India has to break something to come to Lion Kernel. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, Kernel is One. Works. Okay. Thank you. So uh, my comment was that I, I'm not sure if uh, if we should still be, be be expecting people to teach themselves how to program the Linux kernel, because that's what I'm hearing here. No, Maybe I don't think it's about uh, teaching people uh, like how to program Linux kernel. It's about uh, making doors open for the other people because uh, right now it's just you know they start with the check page.pl or s some sort of tools uh, yeah. but uh, if they want to get more involved uh, they should have like tasks and but then on the other hand i'm hearing that uh, maintainers don't have time for so so things so so uh, and they have these brilliant ideas yeah, so why not just put and that's oh. correct because the maintainers uh, the maintainers role is really to, to care to take care about the code yeah. uh, so when and I, and a the problem they they are, they are, they, are, they, are, they address is that when somebody sends a changes change into the code they have to determine the technical merit of the change which by itself may be a, may not be very straightforward sometimes yeah. so maintainers have have things to do uh, and now I think what's missing is, is, is a place where people can learn how to program the Linux kernel, how to participate in the development process, which is part of that, and so on. So maybe there needs to be, uh, this, somebody just needs to start teaching people to do that. Yeah.